door. He's a tugboat and a friendly tugboat too. Pushing and a pulling in the great big harbor in the great big world is so much fun. So many brand new things to discover. Waking with the sun, gotta get the job done. Oh, Theodore and Emily, Boda, Hank and George and the harbor master too. is proud to support Theodore Tugboat and all PBS programs which help children get and stay ready to learn. Theodore, he's a tugboat and a friendly tugboat too. A friendly tugboat too. Oh, Theodore, likes to do the things that friendly tugboats do. Hello. I'm just learning a new song on my harmonica. Paul, oh, can you hear that? Yeah. They're fixing my roof today, and the repairman keeps playing this loud music on his radio. Could you keep it down up there? Thank you kindly. Where was I? Oh, right. Again, I've already asked him once to stop, but he won't listen to me, and I'm the harbor master. Well, now I know how Theodore felt that time he tried to bring his ship into the harbor, who wouldn't listen to him. One fine morning, Theodore was on his way to the edge of the harbor. Cargo ship in, he called to Blandford. Theodore felt proud to be the tug in charge of a ship, all by himself. Blandford the bell boy, who lived out where the waters of the harbor met the wide open ocean, dinged his bell. Big job, he said, but you're the tug to do it. Theodore smiled again, but then he saw the ship heading towards him. The ship looked kind of rough and scruffy. And his cargo looked like it had been just thrown all over his deck. Still, Theodore smiled his best, welcome to the big harbor smile, and floated out to meet him. Hi, I'm Theodore, he called. What's your name? Cabot, said the ship. Theodore moved closer to have a better look at Cabot. It seemed like his cargo was about to fall right off his deck. Was there a big storm out on the ocean? Theodore asked. No, replied Cabot. Why? Well, your cargo was kind of messy, said Theodore, trying to be polite. I like it that way, said Cabot. Theodore began to motor around to the back of Cabot. What are you doing? Cabot wanted to know. We're supposed to check to make sure ships are safe before bringing them into the harbor, replied Theodore. Cabot really didn't look very safe to Theodore. In fact, the closer he looked, the less safe Cabot seemed. I'm safe, said Cabot in a loud voice. I visit harbors all over the world. Have you ever been to another harbor? Well, no, not yet, answered Theodore. But I still can't tow you into the harbor until I'm sure you're safe. You don't have to tow me in, interrupted Cabot, because I'm going in by myself. Well, Theodore couldn't believe his eyes. Cabot cruised right past him, heading towards the big harbor. Theodore hurried after Cabot. 
You better let me button my tow rope onto you now, tooted Theodore. We're almost in the harbor. I want to go in by myself, insisted Kevin. It's very busy today, explained Theodore, still trying to be polite. And you've never been here before. I know how to go into harbors by myself, snorted Kevin. But you can't dock yourself, continued Theodore. It's not safe. Well, I'm bigger than you, interrupted Kevin. And you can't stop me. Kevin made a sharp turn and roared right past Theodore. Swiping Bedford as he went, the little boy went spinning wildly off his spot. Sorry about that, Bedford, called Theodore. Are you okay? Been been better, said Bedford, sounding pretty woozy. Theodore carefully moved Bedford back to his spot. That sh ship isn't so safe, said Bedford. That's what I think, Theodore frowned, and set off after Cabot again. Theodore caught up with Cabot, heading past the oil refinery. Prepare to take my tow rope, Theodore said sternly. Just then, he heard a loud splash. It looked like a piece of cargo had fallen off Cabot's deck. Theodore had no choice but to turn back and save it. Can't stop me, hooted Cabot. Well, Theodore was beginning to think that Cabot was right about that. And he started to think that if he didn't do something to stop him, there would be a lot more trouble than some overboard cargo and a bumped bell buoy. But he was also starting to wonder if there was anything he could possibly do about it. Theodore carefully tied the tank that had fallen off of Cabot to his side and headed after the ship again. A loud honk came from the other side of Willie's Island. I bet I know who that is, said Theodore, hurrying. He went that way, Bedford shouted. That ship almost ran into us, said Hank, who was moving Brunswick Barge. That's Cabot, puffed Theodore. I'm his tug in charge. Looks like he's in charge of you, grinned Hank. Trouble, said Brunswick. No, replied Theodore. You see, Brunswick was always looking for thrills and chills. Suddenly, the harbor was full of honking and tooting. Sure enough, it was Cabot. This time he was weaving dangerously around the fairy twins. Maybe a little trouble, muttered Theodore. Can't stop me, little tuggy, shouted Cabot, dropping more cargo overboard. Once again, Theodore went to rescue the cargo. This is a disaster, he said out loud. Theodore was feeling very discouraged. He had tried asking Cabot nicely to let him take him to his dock, but the ship just wouldn't listen. How do you think I feel? A small voice said. Theodore looked around for the owner of the voice. Over here, said the voice, beside you. The tank was talking to him. Now Cargo was usually very quiet and well behaved, never spoke up. My whole job is just to lie still and stay on my ship, the tank continued. And I can't even do that. It's not your fault, Theodore said kindly. Cabot didn't put you on his deck properly. You're certainly right about that. I'm supposed to be the tug in charge. But, well, he won't do anything I say, added Theodore. Theodore began to collect the cargo. He never does what any of us say, another voice called out. Now... More of Cabot's cargo was talking to Theodore. This time it was a big wooden crate. If you tell him to go slow, said the crate, he speeds up. And if you tell him to tie you on tighter, he makes you looser, said the tank. 
Just because he's bigger than us, he thinks he can do whatever he wants, said a container. He's too wild, said a small piece of cargo. My goodness, said Theodore. He's just not safe, concluded the tank. Theodore was silent a moment. Cabot does exactly what you tell him not to do, he said slowly. That gave Theodore an idea. A great big idea. The cargo all gathered around. I'm going to get you all back where you belong, he told the cargo. But first, I'm going to get Cabot where he belongs. Well, we're fine right here, said the crate. Yes, it's kind of fun floating around, agreed the container. Whee, giggled a small piece of cargo. I'm having a bath. If there's nothing I can do about Cabot, Theodore said to himself, maybe there's something he can do himself. Theodore set about to pick up all his new friends. A little later, Cabot was cruising merrily along when he heard Theodore's whistle again. Try and catch me, shouted Cabot. Whatever you do, called Theodore, don't go to the sandy beach. Where's this beach? said Cabot. Through the bridge at the end of the harbor, answered Theodore. But you really shouldn't go there. It's not safe. Well, sure enough, Cabot began to cruise right under the bridge. Just watch me, he shouted at Theodore. Cabot chugged on towards the sandy beach, honking his horn and roaring his engine. Theodore calmly headed after him. Slow, little tuggy buggy, cackled Cabot. You can't stop me. I can, and I will, Theodore said quietly. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, said Bedford. scraping sound down below his hull. And the next thing he knew, he wasn't moving at all. What happened? He cried out. You didn't let me finish telling you why it's not safe here, replied Theodore. The water's not deep enough for ships. You're stuck on the bottom. Theodore moved into position to tow Cabot. He had been looking forward to this all day. Pretty soon, Theodore got Cabot unstuck and towed him to his dock, backwards. I can't see where I'm going protested Cabot. He felt very silly being tugged backwards through the harbor with everyone watching. I think it's safer this way, smiled Theodore. So do we, called his cargo. We all do. Cabot visits from time to time, and I must say, I think he's much better behaved now. Certainly better behaved than that roof repairman and his loud music. Well, I think I know what Theodore would do. There, that's much quieter. Thanks for visiting us here in the Big Harbor, and we'll see you all again next time. Now, I can finally get a chance to play my harmonica. There's another story coming right up, and you can always learn more about Theodore Tugboat on the internet.
find us through PBS Online. Pushing and a pulling in the great big harbor in the great big world is so much fun. So many brand new things to discover. Waking with the sun, gotta get the job done. Oh, Theodore and Emily. Vote up Hank and George and the harbor master too. Hello. I'm just doing some work. Oh, yes. There's always lots to do in the big harbor. Ah, that's Theodore's whistle. I'll just put my pencil here. Come see. Oh, look at that. There's no one there. Oh, oh, I know. Theodore, behind the dispatcher. Yeah, I gotcha. <laughs> you see, Theodore and I, we, we have this little joke. He blows his whistle, and then he hides. And then I try and find him. It's kind of fun. Except, you know, one time, Theodore played a joke, and something, something very surprising indeed happened. You know? Now, well, that's a story that I could tell you about today. Theodore was taking his good friend Barrington Barge to the oil refinery. Barrington, said Theodore, today, when I finish moving you, let's play our special joke. Okay, Theodore, said Barrington quietly. That's the nice thing about barges, thought Theodore. They're always so nice and quiet. Theodore put a little extra puff into his pull. He couldn't wait to play his favorite joke with Barrington. As soon as Barrington had unloaded his load of big, long tubes at the oil refinery dock, Theodore hurried away, pulling the barge behind him. Where shall we hide today, he called to Barrington. Oh, you decide, replied Barrington. Another nice thing about barges, thought Theodore. They always go wherever you want. It felt great to be in charge of Barrington. It made Theodore feel bigger. Theodore set off to find a good hiding place with Barrington. It was time to play their favorite joke. This looks like a pretty good place to hide, said Theodore, as he pulled Barrington along. They were getting close to Owen, the giant oil rig. Whatever you think, said Barrington. Theodore began to pull Barrington behind one of Owen's great big pillars. Owen, whispered Theodore. Don't tell anyone we're hiding here. Won't tell anyone, bellowed Owen. No siree, Bob, just watch how quiet I'll be. See, Owen is a very noisy oil rig. Theodore and Barrington waited with big, sly grins. And sure enough, along came Petra the pilot boat. Theodore and Barrington held their breath. The best part of the joke was coming right now. Petra knew that Theodore and Barrington always hid when they were finished work. It, it was their special joke. I wonder, said Petra out loud, where can Theodore and Barrington be? Petra looked this way and that way, but she didn't seem to see them. Owen, said Petra, have you seen those two? No siree, Bob, hollered Owen. Oops, oh, oh well, they, they told me to be quiet. Well, Theodore started laughing, and soon Barrington was laughing too. And Petra looked around again, and then, surprise, they yelled. Theodore rushed out, pulling Barrington behind him. There you are, said Petra. You did surprise me. Theodore and Barrington laughed and laughed all the way back to Barrington's dock. Tomorrow, said Theodore, we'll find a, a really great place to hide. Fine by me, said Barrington. So long, Barrington, said Theodore. And he headed home, still giggling a little as he went. What a great joke, he said to himself. The next morning, during the regular work meeting, the dispatcher turned to Theodore and said, Theodore, today you will be moving Barrington, as usual. Theodore's two toots said, yes, sir. Theodore set off to get Barrington, swaying back and forth a little, the way he did when he was especially happy, already thinking of where he was going to hide this time with Barrington. I bet this will be the best day I've ever had, he said to himself. 
Now, as soon as Barrington had unloaded his big, long tubes at the oil refinery dock, Theodore said, Let's hide. Okie dokie, said Barrington. This time, said Theodore, we'll find a place we've never been before. Well, they found a little secret cove just beyond the big smokestacks. This looks like just the right size for us, said Theodore. Do you think someone will find us way out here? said Barrington. Oh, don't worry, Barrington, replied Theodore in his most grown-up voice. Someone always finds us. Theodore carefully backed Barrington into the little cove and then squeezed in beside him. And the two were hidden by the rocks and trees around the cove. This is our greatest hiding place ever, said Theodore. Well, it wasn't too long before Petra came floating by, looking for Theodore and Barrington. Of course, she knew they were hiding. Theodore! Barrington! She called. Are you there? Shh! Theodore whispered to Barrington, and they both tried hard not to laugh. Theodore? Barrington! Petra called again. Where are you? Theodore, whispered Barrington. Aren't you going to pull me out now when we yell surprise? Oh, not yet, whispered Theodore. It seemed the more worried and nervous Barrington got, the more brave and excited Theodore felt. Barrington? Theodore? That's strange, she frowned. They usually don't hide this long. Ah, uh, Theodore, said Barrington. Petra's leaving. Theodore moved ahead to look. And sure enough, Petra was going away. Oh, someone else will come along, said Theodore. And then he rumbled his engine a little, like he was getting ready to rush out and yell surprise. But inside, he was beginning to wonder what would happen, too. He wanted Barrington to think he was really good at jokes. Petra went to talk with the dispatcher. They always hide on me, and I usually find them right away, Petra was saying. It's our joke. But this time, I couldn't find them anywhere. This is very strange, said the dispatcher. And then he looked around as if he were hoping Theodore and Barrington would come floating by any moment. The other tugs could see that it would soon be dark. Maybe they had an accident, said Fodok. Well, there is only one thing to do, said the dispatcher. I will have to declare them officially lost. I'll ask Constance, the Coast Guard ship, to search for them. Everyone was very quiet after the dispatcher said that. They knew that sending an important ship like Constance to look for Theodore and Barrington meant that this was now a very serious matter. Fodok, as you are the safety tug, said the dispatcher, please go with Constance and help her search. Proceed immediately. Fodok whistled his most serious whistle and set off to meet Constance. I hope Theodore and Barrington are all right, said Hank. All the other tugs were hoping the same thing. It was now almost dark. The small cove where Theodore and Barrington were hiding was full of long shadows and strange night sounds. Now, Barrington being a barge is usually nice and quiet. How long do you think we'll have to hide? Said Barrington in a very quiet voice. Not long, I think, replied Theodore. Until tomorrow? Asked Barrington. Maybe, answered Theodore. Theodore, said Barrington. Yes, Barrington. Is tomorrow a long time? I hope not, Barrington, said Theodore. I hope not. Both boats shivered. A cool nighttime breeze was beginning to blow. Just then, Barrington saw something. It's a light, he said. Someone is shining a light. Listen, whispered Theodore. Sure enough, someone was calling. Theodore! Barrington! That's Fodok, said Theodore excitedly. He's looking for us, said Barrington. Are you ready? whispered Theodore. I'm very ready, Theodore, said Barrington. Theodore waited until Fodok was almost past them. Surprise! They yelled. Theodore rushed out, pulling Barrington behind them. Where have you two been? An angry voice said. 
Theodore and Barrington looked around, and there was Constance, the Coast Guard ship, and she was shining her biggest searchlight right at them. Constance, said Theodore, what are you doing here? Everyone has been looking for you, said Constance. Do you know how worried we all were? We were hiding, said Barrington with a great big grin. Wasn't it a great joke, added Theodore. A joke, said Constance, as if she couldn't believe what Theodore had said. Well, it's certainly not funny. You will take this barge to his dock and report to the dispatcher immediately. And with that, Constance floated off with Fodak. Theodore pulled Barrington to his dock. I think we're in trouble, said Theodore. Why? said Barrington. I don't know, said Theodore miserably. This is the worst day I've ever had. Me too, said Barrington. After Theodore had taken Barrington home, he returned to the great ocean dock. All the other tugs were asleep, but the dispatcher was waiting up for him. Constance said you wanted to see me, sir, Theodore said in a very small voice. The dispatcher could see that Theodore was tired and upset. You'd better get some sleep now, Theodore, he said. We'll have a talk in the morning. Yes, sir, said Theodore, and he headed off to his dock. But tired as he was, Theodore couldn't sleep. Why is everyone so upset with me? I hope I can see Barrington again. Further along the harbor, Barrington couldn't sleep either. I hope I can see Theodore again, he said softly. The next morning, Theodore was thinking of what he would say to the dispatcher. He decided to practice on Donald Dock. Maybe, said Theodore, Barrington and I hid too long? Uh-huh, said Donald. Is that why everyone was upset with us, said Theodore? Uh-huh, said Donald. You see, uh-huh is all Donald ever says. It wasn't Barrington's fault, Theodore continued. I'm the one who made up the joke. Do you think the dispatcher will let Barrington and me work together again? Uh-huh, a voice said, but it wasn't Donald. Theodore slowly turned and saw that the dispatcher was looking at him. You mean, said Theodore, I can work with Barrington? Theodore, said the dispatcher, the reason we were all so upset was, well, we didn't know you were only playing a joke. You were gone so long we all thought you were lost. I guess a joke isn't funny if it makes everyone worry, said Theodore sadly. But can I work with Barrington again? Well, maybe my good friend Donald Doc has something to say about that, said the dispatcher with a smile on his voice. Uh-huh, said Donald. A little later, Theodore was taking Barrington Barge to the oil refinery on the other shore. It sure is a great day, said Theodore. The best day ever, said Barrington. You know, Theodore and Barrington sure have a lot of fun working together. Well, speaking of work, I better get back to mine. Thanks for visiting us here in the Big Harbor. And we'll see you all again next time. Now, where did I put my pencil? Do you think someone is playing another joke on me? Oh, no. I... <laughs> yep. Looks like I kind of played a joke on myself, huh? Bye-bye. Theodore. He's a tugboat and a friendly tugboat too. A friendly tugboat too. Oh, Theodore likes to do the things that friendly tugboats do. Hello. Isn't this a beautiful castle? I'm going to put it in the bottom of my fish tank. My friend Rodney has one just like it in his fish tank. That's where I got the idea. Except my castle is much bigger than Rodney's. And when he sees it, he's going to think that my tank is the best. I'm going to invite him over to see it. But first, I'm going to very carefully take the top off my tank. Put it over there. And then, all right, fish, here's your new castle. Oh, you look at that. It's supposed to sit on the bottom of the tank. 
but it won't sink. I'm getting a sinking feeling that I don't want to invite Rodney over. That's kind of funny, actually. You see, just the other day, Hank had a sinking feeling, too. And a sunken ship. One dark and moonlit night, out by the entrance to the big harbor deep beneath the waves, Northumberland submarine was cruising home from his underwater patrol. He saw something hidden beyond the edge of a great underwater cliff. He nosed himself around the edge and gasped out loud at what he saw. There, on the bottom of the ocean, lay a sunken ship, forgotten and mysterious. Wait till I tell the tugs about this, he shouted. Back at the Great Ocean Tug and Salvage Company dock, the tugboats were gathered round for storytelling time. George was beginning another one of his big stories. I was moving over in the oil rig out on the ocean, he announced. George boomed his engine just to make sure everyone was listening to him very carefully. Suddenly, I saw a giant iceberg coming straight for us. The tugboats all moved a little closer to hear every word. How big was the iceberg? Asked Fodok. Oh, big as a building, boomed George. Hank squirmed his way into the circle. I was moving a barge once, he said in his biggest voice. Yes, Hank, asked George. And I saw a, a, a bumper in the water coming straight for us. Hank tried to roar his engine like George, but it was more of a burp than a boom. <clears throat> he said, clearing his throat. The, the bumper was as big as a, as a... As a bumper, suggested Fodak. I, I guess so, said Hank quietly. Anything else, Hank? Asked Emily. No, said Hank. So, <clears throat> anyway, there I was, said George, continuing his story. Hank looked around at the faces of the other tugs, all smiling at George. I wish I had a better story to tell, he said to himself. No sooner had Hank said that, when a voice shouted, Guess what I found? Northumberland submarine had popped up beside the tugs. A sunken ship, he shouted. Well, that is very interesting, said Vodak. Yes, tell us about it, Northumberland, smiled Theodore. The tugboats all moved very close to hear every word. Northumberland began to tell them about the sunken ship. Even the dispatcher turned to listen. As Hank listened too, he began to grow more and more excited. A sunken ship, he said to himself. If only I could bring that ship back up, that would be the best story ever. Bright and early the next day, before the other tugboats were even awake, Hank quietly slipped away from the great ocean dock. He hurried over to the Navy Yard, where he found Northumberland fast asleep, of course. Northumberland always slept all day and cruised under the ocean at night. Northumberland! Northumberland! whispered Hank. Wake up! Wake up! He gave the sub a little nudge just to get things going. Huh? said Northumberland groggily. Is it nighttime already? Northumberland, said Hank. Can you show me where the sunken ship is, please? Can you, Northumberland? Please. Northumberland decided that the only way he was going to get any sleep was to show Hank where the shipwreck was. Oh, this will be a great start to my story, Hank said to himself. Let me see. <clears throat> I followed Northumberland out of the harbor. Hank was already practicing the great story he was going to tell the tugs that night about raising the sunken ship. It was cloudy. The water was very, uh, was very uh, watery. Meanwhile, back at the Great Ocean Dock, the other tugboats were gathering around the dispatcher for the morning work meeting. Where is Hank? said the dispatcher. Well, Theodore looked around, and sure enough, Hank was nowhere to be seen. It feels like a storm's coming in, Fodak told the group. Northumberland and Hank arrived above the sunken ship. It's straight down there, yawned Northumberland. Thanks, Northumberland, smiled Hank. You're welcome, yawned Northumberland, anxious to get back to sleep. 
Hank began to lower his special hauling rope with a big hook on the end to raise the sunken ship. Down, down, down went Hank's rope into the depths. He moved his hook this way, that way, and that way again, trying to snag the sunken ship. Got it, said Hank finally. He made his toughest tugging face. One, two, three, heave. Oh, this ship is really big, Hank said out loud. I, I bet it's bigger than a, than a bumper. No, 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 a building. No, no, bigger than a, a, well, whatever's bigger than a building. Hank didn't notice, but the wind and waves were really beginning to blow and batter him. The storm had arrived. In the big harbor, the other tugboats noticed the storm too, and they also noticed that Hank was still nowhere to be seen. We'll have to search for him, announced the dispatcher. Please proceed immediately. The tugboats set off to look for Hank, bracing themselves against the wind and the whitecaps. I hope Hank's all right, said Theodore quietly. Hank was swinging and swaying this way and that in the storm. While down below, his hauling rope was swinging and swaying too right around the sunken ship's mast. Hank tried to raise the sunken ship again, but it seemed his hauling rope was stuck on something. Are you stuck there, boy? A voice came hollering out of the storm. Hank turned and saw the little cable ship. No, he hollered back. You don't need a tow or not, called Digby. I'm fine, shouted Hank. He wanted this to be his adventure and not Digby's. Well, am I stuck then? Digby went on. No, shouted Hank. Good boy, how oh, good, said Digby. Then I'm heading home. Only mad boats and barnacles stay out in a big blow like this. Hank smiled to himself. A big storm was just great for his story, and this was getting to be a really big storm. Suddenly, his engine quit. Hank had been working so hard trying to raise that sunken ship that he had used up all his oil. Hank saw that the storm was pushing him towards the coast, and he was attached to the ship down below, just like a balloon on a string. Wait till I tell everyone about this, he crowed. I bet those rocks are as big as a bumper. No, a building. No. Well, whatever's bigger than a building. Anyway, he went on, they sure are bigger than me. And then Hank had a thought, a terrible thought. I think, he told himself, I think I'm going to crash into those rocks. Theodore was still searching for Hank near the Navy Yards. It was almost night, and he knew finding his friend in the dark would be even more difficult. Northumberland was just waking up, ready for another night under the ocean. <sighs> Did Hank raise that sunken ship? He yawned at Theodore. Sunken ship, repeated Theodore. I wish I was home in my dock listening to my story right now. Wrong. Instead of still being in my story, one big wave would be all it took to dash him into the rocks. Just then, a faint light pierced the gloom. At first, Hank thought he was seeing things. But then, Theodore appeared through the dark, and Northumberland was with him. <coughs> Hank blew his whistle as loud as he could. <coughs> Over here! Help! <coughs> Theodore! He cried. <coughs> Theodore shouldered on through the storm. My rope is stuck, groaned Hank. Down there. Hold steady, Hank, 
shouted Theodore. Finally, he was close enough to his friend to button on. Thanks for coming, Theodore, said Hank. I'm really glad to see you. Northumberland dived. Down, down, down went the sub. And soon, he could see the trouble. Quickly, he began to untangle Hank's hauling rope. Hank's rope came free so suddenly that the two tugs were almost jerked into the rocks. But Theodore held on, and they were safe. Hank, you'll have a great story to tell everybody tonight, said Theodore as he towed Hank home. I will, said Hank. Sure, Theodore went on, about the sunken ship. But I didn't even raise it, Hank said sadly. I ran out of oil and I almost crashed. I wanted to have the best story, but instead, it's probably the worst story ever. Just then, the other tugs saw Hank. Look, shouted Foduck. There, it is Hank. Theodore was helping him towards the dock. Everyone was overjoyed to see Hank safe and sound again. Tell us what happened, Hank, said Emily. The tugboats all moved very close to hear every word. I, I, I tried to raise a sunken ship, Hank began, but then he stopped. He looked around at all the smiling faces and suddenly he knew just what to say. But the very best part of this story, he told the tugs, is the ending. It's when I came home to all my good friends. That's a great story, Hank, said Foduck. It sure is, agreed Theodore. I remember when I raised a sunken ship once, interrupted George. I, I think it was a super tanker. Well, the tugs all had a very good laugh about that. Hank's story has helped me make up my mind. Even if I can't get my castle to sink, I'm going to invite Rodney over to see my fish tank. It may not have a big castle, but Rodney will still like me just as much. Right now, though, I think I better take this castle back to the pet store. Thanks for visiting us here in the Big Harbor. We'll see you all again next time. I'd look pretty silly with a castle on my head, wouldn't I? <laughs> bye bye. Theodore, he's a tugboat and a friendly tugboat too. A friendly tugboat too. Oh, Theodore, likes to do the things that friendly tugboats do. Pushing and a pulling in the great big harbor In the great big world is so much fun So many brand new things to discover Waking with the sun, gotta get the job done Oh, Theodore and Emily Vodak, Hank and George and the harbor master too Prime Star is proud to support Theodore Tugboat and all PBS programs which help children get and stay ready to learn.